Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be attacking the island of Java. This is... I'm losing track now on the scenarios. Number five or number six of the, the scenario in the Imperial Japanese campaign. We successfully defeated the Allied fleet off the island of Java in the Battle of Java Sea, sinking the majority but not all of the fleet. And we are now uh, presented with the option of invading Java. Uh, that's the next scenario in this uh, campaign. So uh, we're going to be looking at the land side of things. Now, it's not a massive amphibious assault. We're actually already on the shore. Uh, you can see here as we jump in uh, to the briefing, uh, there are some naval elements to this scenario where we can kind of cruise along the shore and bombard the uh, land troops. But really what this is about is the attack on Batvia, uh, I believe, Batavia, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, I know I've gotten corrections on my pronunciations throughout most of the series so far, so I do apologize for that, guys, um, that's not one of my strengths. But anyway, we've got some naval elements that we can cruise up the coast here and help uh, bombard the land forces on the, on the island of Java, uh, we've also got substantial land forces, and... Our main objective here in the east is the Kalati airfield, uh, so the main airfield on Java. So essentially the goal is to take out the airfield and also the capital of the island of Java. Now the Dutch are in our way on the ground. Uh, there may be other enemy naval forces as well, given the fact we didn't destroy the entire fleet. We didn't get that secondary accomplishment in that last battle. And the way that this, uh, this game is crafted quite brilliantly, I might add, is those secondary objectives influence uh, more than just uh, the skill that your opponents are going to face you with, but also the quality of the, uh, or the quality, the number, and, and basically, essentially, the secondary objectives are important. They directly influence the follow-on scenarios, which is not something that would have been the case in games like Panzer Corps, where you might have a different scenario based on whether you got a major victory or not but you wouldn't actually have a different scenario, which is kind of cool. Um, you can see here one other feature that I haven't really looked at before is when you go into the Objectives tab, if you click on the little question mark to the left, it will actually take you to the spot on the map uh, where that objective is located. If that's applicable, uh, it isn't always. So you can see here our main objective is to take Batvia. Uh, the second or the other main objective is to take that airfield. And then we've got another objective to destroy 10 enemy cargo trucks. I assume that's to kind of simulate uh, destroying the enemy equipment and, and limiting their ability to retreat and continue to fight. Uh, but we'll see how that pans out. So now at this point, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned before, and that's because, I'll be honest, I didn't fully understand it. I was kind of doing more of an initial impressions and a playthrough just to sort of gauge how the game plays and, and kind of learn it on the fly, which I think this game is very able to do. Um, but one thing I did notice is the supply system is far deeper than I actually thought. You'll see there are these numbers on these cities which kind of represent their supply points, uh, which, uh, again... Unlike Panzer Corps or Panzer General or any of the games in that series, you can't simply put all your units around one defensive location and hold, because if you try and do that, what will actually happen is the supply in that city, because cities are given a certain amount of supply, will be used up by all the defenders and cause you to have supply problems. Similarly, when you land troops on a beach, you need support ships, which is representing cargo ships unloading supplies for those troops on the beach. Uh, they need to be adjacent to the beach hexes or adjacent to your, your front line as it expands off the beach. Uh, if you don't do that, your troops will run out of supply. If you don't have sufficient supply on those ships to provide supply to all the troops that are on the shore, then you will have a reduced supply. So you get like a little yellow circle next to the unit. A red circle represents no supply. A yellow circle represents limited supply. So that can happen as well. You can see here I'm deploying my naval forces, which are part of my core, which carried over from the previous battle, um, which makes that purchase of the Nagato-class battleship that much more useful because it gained quite a bit of experience in the last battle, and now it will gain further experience as it gets to sail up and down the coast, bombarding the enemy troops on the shore. 
Uh, also, uh, in putting some of my air forces on the map, I don't have any zero or fighter aircraft, uh, which could come back to hurt me in later scenarios. I need to start getting some of those guys and getting some of their experience up. You can see here our infantry is starting to gain quite a bit of experience as well. Uh, the experience seems to grow more slowly than maybe in Panzer Corps. I could be wrong on that. I don't know the exact amount of fights you need to get to gain a star. But some of my units only have, you know, a half star and they've been engaged in every single battle thus far. I know it's in the manual, but um, again, one of the things that I enjoy about these types of games is the ability to just kind of pick up and play uh, without having to worry too much about the detail of, well, how many fights, how many engagements do I have to have before I can actually, you know, experience up or level up and while there certainly are games that I play and that I enjoy that really require that sort of min max approach knowing all the rules knowing every little intricacy behind the game in order to be good at it and be successful at it there are also games that I enjoy where I don't have to do that and this is that perfect blend in my eye um, this is a game where there is quite a bit of depth to it, much more than I've presented in a lot of my videos. If you look at you know, some of my previous videos, I'm just kind of winging it to a large degree. And I think that's fine, because with this type of game, there is a lot more depth than I think a lot of critics are probably going to give credit to the game because of the way the supply system works, because of the way this, the experience system works, because a lot of the design decisions behind the game make the game so visually um, easy to pick up and play you know it's easy to pick this game up play get a general sense of how to play and then go from there i think the hardest thing to really understand is if you're not familiar with war games you may not have a total clear understanding of how exactly the supply system works and maybe some of the, the smart decisions you should make but in general this game is incredibly easy to pick up and say i just want to start playing this game and see how it goes and that's something I really appreciate personally because there are not enough war games out there like that. There are not enough games out there where you can just play the game and figure things out as you go. And I think that's one of the things that some of the games that come out these days where people criticize them as, oh, they're just dumbing down the experience. If you look into them, I think this is a game that you could look at and you could say, is this game dumbing down the experience? You know, it's a simple game. You just move across the map. It's like a puzzle. You got to min-max it, figure out where the best units are, what the right combination is, and just move across the map and do it by a certain time. Um, and it's not about tactics or anything like that. But really, fundamentally, this game is about a common theme in war games, and that's the, the thing this game is fundamentally about, is supply. At least that's my, my vision of this game, is it's fundamentally about supply, and supply lines, and front lines. And that's why there's that important distinction in this game, where they show those front lines, and that's not something that's in the Panzer Corps games. So, to me, this is a game very much like uh, Unity of Command, where logistics is the heart of this game but it's easy to miss because the game is so accessible and i don't think that's a problem but um i don't even know where i was going with this other than i think the game does a great job of communicating uh how to play easily without overwhelming you without feeling like um you know you you need to be a war game expert in order to be good at it while at the same time, um, having a much deeper experience than I think a lot of people would probably give it credit for. That was my only point. But anyway, as you can see here, we are uh, beginning the campaign, uh, beginning the drive on Batvia. Uh, and, and I hope I'm not causing anyone to pull their hair out with my horrible pronunciations. We've got our fleet bombarding the enemy infantry ashore, uh, and we've got our infantry waiting across the river here after the enemy destroyed that first bridge in front of us in an attempt to slow us down. So we'll bring in our dive bombers here and uh, drop some pain on these guys. Also, there's some trucks here that we need to destroy. That's one of our objectives is just to, to destroy at least 10 enemy cargo trucks. Uh, so uh, that's where we're at as well. Again, the plus symbol representing the fact that the infantry has support from other infantry units. And we quickly drove that first enemy unit back. Um, and are, are now beginning our advance. Now, this campaign is, or this battle is a little bit tricky. It's a, it's a pretty big map, uh, which I like, and you have to take 
really only two cities, but they're at the opposite ends of the map. Uh, they're very different types of battles. One of them is more of a city fight, and one of them is more of a, a fight for just like a country airfield. And the enemy is quite strong in this scenario, as you'll see here. I've actually already played the scenario, and I'm just um, playing for the... As you can see here, I run my uh, armored car unit straight into an enemy ambush across the bridge. I, th I would have thought my armored car, which is a recon unit, would have been able to see those guys dug in on the other side from two hexes away, but I suppose I was wrong. I'm going to have a bit of trouble here on the southern end of the map initially. The enemy puts up quite a stiff resistance. My initial goal was to launch the direct attack on the city and then have this southern force kind of flank and steal around the map. I was hoping they'd be able to sneak around and uh, take the airfield in in the rear essentially uh, by going down the southern end of the map but as you can see here the enemy has defended uh, all three well two of the approaches the northern approach and the southern approach this kind of middle bridge approach uh, is seems to be undefended at this point um, it's a 40 turn scenario uh, you need to complete everything by the 30th turn for a major victory uh, the three major objectives are to destroy 10 trucks, to take Latvia, and to take the airfield in the east. Uh, you can see the enemy has destroyed another bridge to try and slow us down. So, we've got a lot more naval forces deployed than uh, the game gives you for this scenario. You only start with uh, just two destroyers and a cruiser. We've got, we added a second cruiser, we added a battleship, and uh, a destroyer or so. We also have more naval forces that are not really in reserve, but we could raise units that had died earlier in previous battles. So that's kind of a neat feature. I really like that idea for air units and for ground units. I think for naval units, it might not be the best idea. If we're just trying to think of what would be a plausible um, plausible thing to do. You can't really just be like, sure, we're just going to go build another Yamato real quick here, guys, and we'll throw the old crew on it. Um, you can do that for air units because you can build so many aircraft so quick, but you can't really do that for naval units because the capital investment on the uh, equipment is so high. As one would expect, we've got minefields. We don't have any support ships to clear those minefields, though. That's one other thing. I mentioned support ships can provide supply to land units. Well, support ships can also defuse minefields to act as minesweepers. Uh, fortunately, in our movement orders, we perfectly avoided the minefields here. That was just really good luck, I would say, more so than anything. And, uh, yeah, so we just destroyed the enemy unit. We're kind of advancing. You can see here that middle hex, that hex with the golden flag stand, is the uh, is uh, with the star over it in the middle of the city there is the objective that when we take that, we will have it will consider us to have taken Batavia and then uh, give us our first objective as a success. Meanwhile, attempting to destroy these trucks here, uh, they're proving a little bit more of a nuisance than I had hoped. Uh, but we'll just finish on one. Okay, enemy has anti-air. And we didn't destroy it. Lovely. Well, we can have these guys in the south do that. Enemy is using trucks to evacuate troops, equipments, and supplies to the southeast in order to buy more time. We must disrupt this by destroying these trucks. Okay. Uh, you can also see we formed a pocket around this Dutch unit here, which will cut them off from supply, which will make them much easier to defeat. Uh, that's one advantage here of advancing in the south. And then our recon units here just kind of driving around, not really pushing the front line. In the southern port part of the battle, I had someone who asked in one of my comments for my previous battles, they had asked about the Australians and if they were included in this game, if there was an Australian campaign. Well, there is no Australian campaign, but as you can see here, the units in the south are Australian troops. So these guys who are giving us a fit in the south uh, are... Uh, Australian infantry, Australian pillboxes, and what have you. The Australians did fight on the island of Java with the uh, Dutch troops. Uh, obviously, the Dutch East Indies, being just north of Australia, certainly were viewed as a north and northwest, well, I guess north from the, the northern face of the island, but were certainly viewed as a uh, preliminary defense for the island of Australia, or the continent of Australia. Um, you know, they, they were, it's kind of out there as its own, um, almost like a, a perfectly built buffer for the island of Australia. Uh, do you refer to it as an island or a continent or a country or what? But anyway, um, yeah, so there we go. 
So we're advancing. That's the story right now. We're two turns in. Uh, this series will probably be a little bit longer. We might break this battle into three parts. I'm not done with it yet. Haven't decided what to do at the very end of the scenario. I do run into a few performance issues in the last 15 minutes of what I've recorded so far. I haven't finished the battle. I'm on like turn 25 or so. And the game starts to get a little bit laggy and slow on me. I don't think that's the game's performance. It might be my hard drive. Um, I, I When I record, I, I make the mistake of recording these videos using Fraps. I really shouldn't. Um, Fraps is a nice, cheap software option that allows you to record video with really high quality, but its biggest problem is it outputs video in absolutely gigantic unrendered files. Um, this uh, initial recording that I did before things started to stutter a tad uh, was actually recorded about an hour and 15 minute play session uh, and 300 gigabytes of uh, was the file size for about an hour and 15 minutes. So Again, I think it might just be the hard drive. It might be just the file. There's not enough free space. It is a terabyte drive, but I don't know. I, I haven't had this issue before, um, but I, I don't know. I don't think it's the game. It maybe it is. I have. Uh, it, it could be, but I don't want to criticize the game without knowing for sure. So, um, I guess I don't even know why I brought that up. Maybe I shouldn't have. Anyway, here you can see I am advancing into Patvia. I haven't had a whole lot of opportunities to research the actual land campaign of Java. I've been so thoroughly in love with this game. You can see there there's a radar station, by the way, with the little twirling radar dish. Uh, one other thing, I'll just break in here real quick. Radar stations obviously are non-mobile, so it's just kind of there. And when you advance past them, you don't take them. You do have to attack them to take them. Uh, but... What they do is they show you enemy units, enemy, enemy air units that is. They'll show you a little blinking icon from a long, long distance away so you'll know, hey, there's an enemy air unit here. But it won't tell you what type of unit it is. It'll just tell you that there's an air unit here. Which essentially what that is doing is telling you, you know, there's enemy aircraft inbound. However, there's no way for you to know what they are. And that's pretty realistic for this particular time frame. Radar really wasn't able to tell... Are they fighters? Are they bombers? You could probably make it out depending on their speed which with, with which they were advancing. But outside of that, you couldn't really tell, oh, there's 100 Fock Wolf 190s incoming. Uh, we better get our fighters up or there's, you know, a bunch of B-17s. Radar wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, intelligent enough, wasn't sophisticated enough to be able to make that kind of a determination. But anyway, we took out that pillbox here, so the first of the Australian defenses in the south uh, have been breached. However, you can see this is a kind of a defense in depth situation. So the pillbox was destroyed, and the enemy's got like four more infantry units, and we're losing pretty darn heavy casualties. Uh, so not, not having so much fun right now <laughs> with these uh, Australians putting up a pretty darn good fight here in the south. Um, all right, so... One other factor which I really enjoy with the game, which goes hand in hand with the game being more of a game about supply lines and kind of front lines and logistics, is the fact that the way this game seems to play out, at least in most of the bigger scenarios with more maneuver, such as this, or Manila, or Bataan even, is that you get a strong enemy front line right up front uh, that kind of bars your way from a rapid advance but then once you breach that line once you break through the enemy front there seems to be uh, a more of an open open feel or you know you kind of you sprint through the enemy front line essentially and um, that's really interesting to me because it seems to uh, support the way in which warfare was fought in the mobile mobile era, especially this era with the era of front lines, where the enemy positions their forces up front, you attack, you fight, uh, you break through, and then the enemy forms a new front line somewhere else further in the rear. Sometimes they may launch or, or have um, delaying areas where they'll set up like a roadblock, uh, which... Um, I don't want to spoil things too much, but you'll end up seeing that later in this uh, battle as well, as there's kind of these like roadblocks that are set up strictly with the point not of defeating you, but of delaying you. And it gives strategic importance to these locations which have no victory importance at all. 
they're strictly a roadblock. In other games like this in the past, like the Panzer Corps series, the Panzer General series, the only blocks you would face is when you'd get to the objective points, because that's all the AI knew how to do. The AI knew how to throw up a defensive position around an objective, and that's about it. Whereas in this game, you get that front line, you breach it, and then you race through to wherever the enemy set up another defensive line. And maybe it's just creative scripting to, to make the game more competitive that way. Um, you know, obviously a lot of it has to do with the way the game's designed and the way it's set up and all of that. But the fact that you can break through the enemy front line and then it feels like you've you've achieved this breakthrough and now you're racing through to exploit it and the enemy feels like they're kind of racing to counter you or to slow you down. That element I think is really interesting and I enjoy quite a bit. Uh, you really get a sense of, all right, we've breached them. Now we can choose to mop them up and maybe slow our advance and give the enemy more time. Or we can try and exploit it, race through, get as far as we can, and press the enemy front line. And I didn't really talk about it too much, but I really felt that way in the uh, Batan scenarios, the fall of Batan. Uh, that one really, that, that sort of sense really came home to me where you breach this first enemy position, you race through, the enemy's second position isn't totally set up yet and you can try and kind of race through and get there and, and maybe get some get through while there may be some holes there's there certainly are some fortified positions there but not you know not the entire position being fortified so I, that's one really cool thing which i think uh fits well with this era of warfare is in the way war was fought is you'd have a front line you'd break through the enemy would attempt to uh, form a new front line while you try and race and, and get there before they can and then also that element of there being important spots on the battlefield that are not objective points that adds a sense of tactics it adds a sense of this real sort of combat flair which just doesn't exist in so many of these turn-based kind of simple war games they just miss that point of you know how do you make this game feel important how do you make this uh this engagement feel important uh, when maybe it isn't according to the objectives of the campaign. Well, you know, you could make more objective points. That's one option where you make crossroads on the way toward the real objective, the real city, where you make those points more important. Or or you could do more like what this game does, where the, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, is either scripted to or is smart enough to set up defensive positions along the way that are not strictly roadblocks they're not an objective point you gain nothing by taking them but they build their own sense of importance because you have to get to an objective and there are these forces that are in the way that are set up there to stymie you um, because that's the way that they were positioned or that's the way that the AI decided to defend them maybe they're hidden objectives maybe you know it's a objective to the AI kind of behind the scene or it's like defend this location with one unit at all times and uh, you know that's certainly another alternative which I haven't really thought about till just now but I, I'm not sure how the design works behind there but however it's done it, it was done very well in this game where you certainly feel like there are places on the map where you would think that was a critical turning point in the battle. Taking that crossroad was a critical, important point in this fight. Uh, but there's no real objective point to it. It's not like, oh yay, I took it. I took objective A. You know, it's it's deeper than that. And I think that's e I think that's neat. I think that feels unique, um, regardless of how it's done underneath the hood. You can see here on the southern end of the battlefield, the uh, Australians continue to stymie me. Looks like they've fallen back a little bit, but they're still quite a strong force. We've also run into some enemy coastal uh, guns, a coastal battery, and uh, in the north we're starting to advance through the city, so we're starting to kind of break down the enemy defensive position in the north. In the south, meanwhile, things are very much in a ebb and flow. We take two objectives, the enemy counterattacks, drives us back, and nearly destroys our units. Uh, so it's a very intense fight in the south. In the north, I would say the difference is that naval gunfire support and those critical units which were carried over from the previous battle, uh, giving us a much stronger artillery advantage in the north because of having a battleship with 16-inch guns, having two cruisers instead of just one, and having three destroyers instead of just two. All of that additional firepower is telling, and uh, the weight of that firepower is going a long way 
to deciding this battle here. As you can see there, we destroyed that entire air unit via artillery. We destroyed almost that entire anti-tank unit uh, via naval gunfire. So the enemy's, uh, enemy's forces are really melting away under heavy naval gunfire. The next issue we're going to have to deal with with our ships, though, is this coastal battery, which I'm not sure how difficult it is going to be to deal with or, or what have you. Um, this video is going to be a little bit shorter because I think I'm going to break this battle into three videos instead of two, uh, just because of the length that it's been going. Um, I think I'll probably cut this video off around 30 minutes, so um, it'll be a few more minutes here uh, as we continue attempting, I wouldn't really, maybe, is it mopping up? I mean, we've advanced and yeah, I'd call this mopping up pretty much. So as we continue to mop up uh, the enemy troops around Batvia, they've already lost, they just don't know it. Um, I don't know if I've built any pontoon bridges yet. I need to replace some of these bridges which the enemy destroyed as well. We uh, landed our air units there which were taking pretty heavy casualties. The enemy any aircraft guns can be a pretty decisive factor in this game. Um, meanwhile in the south just trying to rest and recuperate for our next drive. Uh, it was a good decision, I think, to deploy our 75mm artillery pieces in the south uh, as, uh, as it's clearly been uh, more of a, a, a near-run thing than I had expected. Uh, I did not expect the enemy to deploy quite that many troops. You can see here our, sh our Stuart tanks are down to two, but we cannot uh, recruit more troops. And the reason for that is those tanks were seized during the uh, attack on Bataan and they were captured tanks from the Americans. So obviously the Japanese might ha might find some spare parts, they might capture some spare parts or stumble across them or what have you, but they're not going to be able to manufacture replacement tanks, and so the game limits your ability to give replacements to those units. So that's a pretty neat feature. Uh, intuitive and smart, but uh, not something that every game would have uh, thought to do. But this game did. Um, Changing gears just slightly here uh, as we kind of close in on the tail end of this video as we work through this turn. Uh, I'm recording this on May 5th of 2015. It will certainly be up sometime after that. I'm debating maybe slowing down my, my uh, video posting uh, in order to, to try and maybe space this out a bit more. I'm not sure. This is going to be a long series, but I might instead of posting a video every day, I might post one every other every other day. Um, I, do, I don't want to wear my channel out uh, where people feel like I'm just throwing content up there. And I kind of felt feel like, at least in this video, there, there really hasn't been any discussion of historical topics. And that bothers me because then I'm just talking about the game and that's not really where I'm at. I mean, Let's Plays are fun, don't get me wrong. I, I definitely watch a few of them. But to me, in order for a video like this to really have any kind of worth, it needs to discuss something more than just... Um, the gameplay. Unless it's a review, unless it's a critical review, which is different, um, but if it's an actual let's play where it's just someone talking about why they're playing the way they're playing or how they're playing, that's fine, but I think in order to really be a useful let's play or in, to be um, a, a more entertaining let's play, I think you need to mix that with some other discussion um, where the video or the gameplay kind of becomes um, a Oh, it's almost like an accessory to the main point of the video. Uh, in some cases, that's wrong. In, in initial impressions, I don't even classify as Let's Plays. So, like, the first two videos in the series, well, I guess you could certainly, now that it's gone on as many episodes as it has, you'd certainly classify it as a Let's Play. But it was really more of just like, here, I'm playing this game, and these are my thoughts, and here's what you see, and, and here, you know, almost like a, an ad-lib review. Um, although, I don't call it a review because I don't feel like I do reviews. Um, I certainly don't think it would be appropriate for me to do reviews where I would score games. And the reason for that is actually where I was going to go with my last uh, topic of discussion in this video, other than the fact that, you know, I don't feel like I did a good job of adding any extra value to the, the video series here in this game. In this particular video, I feel like I should have uh, mixed in some historical topics about the Java campaign, which I did not do, which I was not pleased about. Um, but... I digress. The other aspect, and one of the reasons I don't critically review games and don't say, well, this game is worth buying or it's not buying, generally I'm 
pretty amb ambivalent. You can buy a game if you think you'll like it. You don't have to buy it if you don't think you'll like it. It's up to everyone's personal taste. And these are just my own opinions when I talk about a game. But going back to my digression, the reason uh, that I don't review games is while I have never at least to this date, uh, that may not be true for very long, but I have never taken an actual paycheck from a game developer yet. Uh, I have partaken in the uh, Scourge of War uh, team, whatever, you know, making the Scourge of War games. Uh, I've made some videos on those, but long after I made my first videos, I ended up joining the Scourge of War team a little bit over a year ago. Um, I don't know if I've made any videos since then. Maybe one, maybe some of the 150th anniversary videos came after I joined the team. But I am on the Scourge of War team, and um, the most recent or the newest game in the series, Scourge of War Waterloo, was actually just announced today. Again, this video is probably coming up a bit after that. Um, but the this newest game, Scourge of War Waterloo, was just announced. It's coming out on June 11th, and uh, I just figured I would share that because... Again, uh, I'm not a critic. I'm not saying buy X, Y, or Z, and the reason for that is because of my affiliation. Uh, however, much more of a passion project it is than anything uh, with the Scourge of War team. I really, 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 really enjoy those games, uh, and I, I know a lot of you do. I know a lot of you have, you know, said when are you going to do some more Scourge of War videos? Well, there will be quite a few more Scourge of War videos when Scourge of War Waterloo, the next game, comes out. It's coming out on June 11th of 2015, seven days before the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, and the game will include some 20-plus scenarios as well as a campaign. A sandbox campaign uh, which has been announced with it as well so um, a pretty exciting time period uh, again I'm not a coder I'm not an artist really I made uh, the extent of what I've made in the game uh, was a few textures which is still kind of cool that I can say yeah, I have some textures that I made that'll be in the game um, not any graphics for troops or anything like that and I'm not that talented something you know basically text um, but mo my role was more of testing um, and kind of quality control although I probably should wait till the game comes out to see you know, if, if people think it's buggy or not to say that um, but yeah so that's exciting for me that's just something I wanted to share that that game is coming out uh, on June 11th, that launch date has been announced, and it will be in time for the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. But that's enough of me rambling about that here. Uh, you can see we've taken Batavia. Uh, our advance continues, and we're moving our warships in to start attacking these coastal uh, fortifications here. Uh, doesn't seem like they're too much of a threat. They've done a very small amount of damage to our warships, uh, so... Yes, that's good. I'm guessing they're pretty light guns. Uh, my, my hunch would be that the defense guns around the Java area probably were six or seven inch uh, artillery pieces. That's how a lot of the land batteries were at this time. There were very few locations that had heavy, you know, 12, 12 inch batteries or were not totally uncommon, especially earlier in World War I. But uh, anything above that was very rare. You would very rarely see 15-inch shore batteries. I want to say Corregidor had some that would have been battleship size. They might have been 14-inch. I don't know if they were 15, but either way, that's one of the few forts in the Pacific that would have had very heavy uh, anti-ship guns. All right, guys. Well, um, I could continue rambling and talking about nothing and adding uh, no value to the series, or... Uh, I could cut this video off here and uh, become uh, have a better intro here using the same footage for the uh, the next video, which is probably what I'll do. That way I have something more useful to talk about uh, other than me just kind of rambling on and on and on like I am right now. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in for this video. This is uh, the battle uh, for Java, the actual land battle for Java here. You can see here we're slowly breaking through on the south. Hopefully the enemy doesn't have any troops built in around this city. 
or we might run into another roadblock as we're getting bled like crazy. Um, but anyway, we're slowly advancing in the south and the north. We've broken through and are starting to move rapidly. Uh, a good initial couple of turns uh, for the attack on Java as we're about to deal with some coastal fortifications and lots and lots of enemy artillery. Uh, but anyway, guys, thank you for tuning in. Uh, it means quite a bit to me that uh, that you guys take the time to watch and comment and like and, dis and you know favorite and all of that. Videos may start alternating days if they haven't already by the time this goes up. Like I said, I'm recording this on May 5th. So far, I've posted a video every single day for the last six days. Uh, I don't want to wear people out. But I do appreciate you all tuning in. Uh, I certainly look forward to any comments, any you know requests, anything along those lines. I may also start mixing in some videos from other games. It's been probably a little too long. I, I have never done nine, six, or seven straight videos, or even eight straight videos on one game before. Um, I usually be a little bit more uh, more. Um, diverse so I certainly will look to um, maybe broaden things up a bit but I am not going to stop this series I am going to win this war as the Japanese or so my goal is so we'll see how things go we'll see where we pick up from here but uh, until next time that's enough of that and this is the historical gamer saying thank you so much for watching guys I really do mean that I do appreciate that and until next time I'm out